body, speech, and mind held in perfect oneness. I send my heart along with the sound of the bell. May the hearers awaken from forgetfulness and transcend all anxiety and sorrow. Good evening, my uh, dear brothers, sisters, and friends. Welcome to our weekly uh, Friday meditation session. Today is the 2nd of uh, December, 2016. How are you? I just uh, back uh, from uh, <coughs> one month uh, pilgrimage in uh, Bhutan, India, and uh, Sri Lanka. In Buddhist uh, practice, there is a practice called Buddhist pilgrimage. In Vietnamese, we call Han Hương. Han means you create, you make it possible. Hương means the sense of the fragrance. Han Hương means it's not only a trip that you, um, like a tour, but it is a practice because uh, even a week or two weeks or a month, the whole time that you in the pilgrimage tour, you have to practice. That's why the policy of those who attend the pilgrimage like this, they have to practice the vegetarian. They wear simple clothes. So as long as they're able to adapt with all conditions, especially when you go to India. India, India is the country, you know, still a lot of pollution, very difficult, and the, the, the road is very rough. Sometimes only 40 kilometers. It took about two hours drive. And if you're able to accept, if you're able to get along with it, you already learn the practice of patience. You may have a lot of uh, good conditions while you're in Edmonton or where you will live. You can eat anytime, you can sleep anytime, you have a lot of a very convenient daily life, daily needed. But once you attend a pilgrimage like this, especially when you go back to India, and there is nothing you should expect it but you have to learn how to adapt. 
And what is the purpose, even though you know, the place is not... <clears throat> but what is the purpose there? You want to see, you want to pay respect, you want to witness the holy places where the Buddha lived in the past. And that is the main point. And that is the, 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 the destination. And because of that spiritual destination, that's why we're able to overcome our obstacles. <clears throat> Very easy to get sick. Very easy to get sick. And usually I combined, you know, a few countries along with the trip. Let's say this time we go to uh, India, and then we go to Sri Lanka. And we, before we go to Sri Lanka, we go to Bhutan. And you know that Bhutan is the country which is beautiful, extremely beautiful. And that is the country have no traffic lights. You never see any traffic lights in the country. Why? Because people have learned and practiced the five trainings we just read. 80% Buddhism in that country. And what is the main thing that the Buddhists practice? The five trainings. And you know that in, you can see that uh, doesn't have to be a Buddhist in order to learn and practice the five mindfulness trainings. If you read carefully the trainings and you see that these are the things that everyone needs, everybody in this society needs this. Learn to nourish your loving kindness, not to kill. Learn to practice your loving kindness, not to steal, because anything is not belong to you, you don't take it. And we learn to be responsibility of ourselves. We do not engage any other relationship with our love and long-term commitment. Because we want, to we want to protect our happiness, then we will not dare to break the other's family, other's happiness. We learn to live mindfully with our daily conversation. We learn to use loving speech. We learn to listen deeply to each other, to learn from each other and to help others to relieve the suffering deep inside of them. We learn to protect our physical body and our mentally. We try not to use any other things that contain alcohol, toxins, drugs, because those may damage the body, those may damage our mind. Nothing related to anything called religions. It's really reality and practical for a human. <clears throat> when we have one week in Bhutan, we are like people who live in heaven. Every morning, you know, we practice sitting meditation. Beautiful uh, scenes and the weather is nice and fresh. You can, after we, we land it, we step out of the airplane, the, we can feel the freshness of the weather. And after a week there, when we go to India, it's a big difference. People start to cough because of the dust. People get to get sick, everybody, and myself is the worst. People try to cover their face with the mask, but every, after a day traveling, we can see the difference. But not because of that, and we complain. So Han means you make it possible. The same thing with same with the word uh, in Buddhist uh, in Vietnamese they call to to han. When you want to change, you need to do it. You want to make the fragrance of the incense possible. You need to make it. 
By what? By your own practice. You come to any other places, make sure after you leave, you make people feel comfortable with your living. Let's say if we come to visit a friend or a place, after we leave, you know, for after we left, every time when they remind about us, they still have a lot of good things about us to talk, to discuss, and to learn. We cannot live if we if we live in such a way that after we left, we say, "Oh, good, thanks for the living. I hope they will not come again." And that means we totally collapse the way of our life, our practice. So the word that we call hành hương, hành means you make it possible. Hương means the sense of your practice. When I live, when I come to Bhutan and we do charity, and the two guys they cry. And they said, uh, "This is the, the the very special group because you come here with you know not only to enjoy, but you you ask us where can you do charity, and of course we have to try our best to find a place for you to help." So they brought us to the school that taught that, that teach other disability kids. They taught the kids how to stand up by themselves, not to just to take the the, the, the the funding from the government, but they in their own ability, they can do something to make for their own living. So they taught the kids how to do painting, how to do uh, some sewing. They sew all the tiny pockets and. Um, and, and bags, you know, to sell, to make their own money. And we give them, the kids, uh, clothes. And when I go to India, I help uh, poor families. So for the whole thing, for the whole trip, 65 people traveling together like a month. And we all, you know, practice from morning to evening. Even we on the bus for a long drive, 200 kilometers, it took us about 10 hours, 12 hours on the bus. So every morning we do, you know, chanting and sharing during the way, on the way. The Buddha informed before he passed away in the future, if anyone who able to visit the four main holy places where the Buddha got birth, where the Buddha enlightenment, where the Buddha gave the first lecture, and when the Buddha nirvana, and these are what we call the four places that touch your heart. In Vietnamese, we call dong tam. Dong mean doesn't mean it shakes. It uh, down sometimes it, people can understand like annoying you, you know, opposite with the word calmness. But this in this situation, it means it touch your heart. It make you feel something very very special when you when you enter the place. I has been in India for third time, three times. And every time when I step into the place where the Buddha passed away, and I don't know why, I start to cry. Nobody say anything. We just practice, walk silently from the gate to the statue of the Buddha, the, the, the reclined Buddha. But we just, you know, silently and, and cry. And I feel that I am coming back to attend the funeral of the Buddha. And when we cover the statue, you know, like a, a rope on the statue of the Buddha, and the whole people, not only one group, but, you know, any group, when they come to that situation, when they come to that time, and they just start to cry. 
And every time when you go back from a, a, a pilgrimage like this, it nourishes you, it makes your practice more stronger, more stable. Because you know that the Buddha has been sacrificed all his life for the sake of all living beings. And right now there are people you know, who refuse their luxury life, they come back to India. They live in a very difficult conditions in order to build you know, temple, monastery, in the holy places like that. And you know that it is a place where a lot of things that, you know, not enough. So when people want to enjoy, uh, um, they want to want to justify their life, and this is the place, but not India. Especially you are from Asia, you like soy sauce. <laughs> very fine, very hard to find soy sauce. Uh, if you like tofu, not tofu in India. Special, special like that. So when we uh, visit uh, Sri Lanka, also only temples from morning to evening. Every corner you see the statue of the Buddha, which are beautiful, very well, you know, uh, respected, very well organized and And when I ask the local people there, and they say, 75 population, 80% population in Sri Lanka are Buddhism. And we use the five mindfulness, mindfulness trainings as the base of our daily practice. Every Sunday and every Saturday and Sunday morning, they go into the temple, it's like a new year. It's like a big celebration. Buddhism uh, came to uh, Sri Lanka about uh, 2,300 years ago by a prince named Mahinda. He was the son of the King Ashoka. So when the King Ashoka called for a big assembly, and he said that it is time for all of us to bring Buddhism to other countries. So they divide into nine groups. They divide into nine groups. And King uh, Ashoka assigned his son, Mahinda, as a monk, a Buddhist monk, with the other people, bring Buddhism into Sri Lanka 2,300 years ago. When he met uh, the King Tissa, he asked the king, what is this tree? The tree says, this is the mango tree. In this jungle, in this forest, there's only one mango tree, or there are many mango trees? And the king answered, of course, there are many other mango trees. In this jungle, is that only this tree, mango, or all the trees? Of course, beside mango, there are many other trees. Beside mango trees, Beside many trees, what else we have here? They come back. We, beside many other trees, beside many other mango trees, there is this mango tree. Very confusing. But this is a test. Beside me, ourselves, there are many others. Right? Beside many others, there is myself. When you, um, when you practice, when you can see that uh, many other people around us, of course there is us. 
And what is this, the meaning? We are not separate from anyone. We are part of everyone. I used to give, I used to use the same lecture to teach my um, young monks when they were small. I said, each of you is Thai's body. Some of you can be my eyes. Some of you can be my ears. Some of you is my lung. Some of you is my heart. So if one of my body damaged, my body, one of, one of my body part is damaged, that means I don't have a completely body anymore. If one of you is collapsed, of course, this community is not completely part of this community damage. Did you get the idea? So we have to see that we have the responsibility to practice and take good care for the body of the Sangha. Let's say if uh, my eyes is damaged, I only have one eye left, and that means my face is not completely a face because one of my eyes is damaged. So same thing, one monk can be one eye, one monk can be an ear, one monk can be a tongue, a, a lung, a kidney. So if any monk, if any monk is the, not well practiced, then that means this Sangha body is not a, a healthy Sangha body. One of the body part is not well. It means this body has something wrong. This body is sick. It's not a healthy body anymore. And we can bring this lecture and we can learn and practice the same in our daily life. If we, if we are not mindful enough to take good care for, for our life, for our family, then this family can be a little bit damaged. And why we need to sit down? I mean, why we need to sit down for meditation? Because we need to see, we need to reflect deeply what's wrong. Before my trip, I have a, a retreat in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, five days. And there was a monk who lived in that temple, and he is a very handy monk. He can fix anything. He's very handy. So when people come to the temple, people will realize one thing that he never in the temple. He always outside, you know, fixing something, cutting the grass, water the plants. He always working. But one special thing from him, he loved to sing. He can sing all day long. Before I come to a talk, he always sing. He always come and sing to for the for the retreatants. So I remember before I back to Edmonton, he sing a song, and I sit, I sat beside him, and my head lie on his shoulder, and we have a, a good picture together like this. Just before I come back here, two days before I come back here, I received a news that he passed away in Vietnam because of the car accident. He was back to Vietnam to visit his sisters. And when he stopped at the red light, there was a big, uh, a big, um, truck also stopped behind him, but this truck 
the brake is broken, so they cannot completely stop. So the whole truck, you know, ride on his hand. So when they brought him to the hospital, he's still awake. And uh, the doctor told him that we need to cut your, your arm, one of your arm, in order to, 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 to save your life. He said, not a problem, you can do it. But because the hospital doesn't have enough uh, blood to transmit, and he lost, of, he lost lots of uh, blood, so he passed away. But before he passed away, he talked to his sister, do not sue the driver. He's just a truck driver. He doesn't have enough money to, to pay for the case, so do not sue the, the driver. And he passed away. If you go to the back, and uh, there's a young man with a gray T-shirt. He is one of my, uh, my eldest brother in the, in the community. We know each other for 30 years more. We have a lot of good time together when we were young. When I joined the Buddhist group as a young fellow, and he is the eldest brother, he, he looked after me. But I am the one who very close to him. And more than 20 years ago, with his uh, you know, surgery accident, he got, uh, his surgery doesn't uh, turn well, so he totally handicapped for more than 20 years. But never a single word to complain anything. So happy would anything happen to him. So before I leave, I know that I don't know whether I can have a chance to see him again or not. So I pay his the last visit in the hospital. And when he totally coma, his brother called me. I step in, I call his name. He opened his eye, he see me. He tried to bring one hand up. That means he tried to bow. He smiled, he awake again. And that is one of the things that make the doctor surprise and shock. He survived almost a month. Just also two or three days before I come back here, he passed away. One special thing from him is, you know, when he when still, um, when he's still uh, healthy, every time when he gain money from his work, he buy a uh, audio tape, you know, a playing audio tape to record Dharma talks and give for free. 30 years ago, we do not have CD, we don't have <laughs> iPod, phone, we don't have anything like that. Only record in the cassette tape, the playing tape. And he bought a lot of that and we, myself and him, we record all the talks and give them for free. Even when he already sick, he still attend Sunday school to teach the kids. He only stop when he totally cannot walk. He need to sit in the wheelchair. And that is the time that he stopped, you know, coming here and, and, and be with the young people. Otherwise, every Sunday he try his best to walk here. What can I learn from him? The, the spiritual of uh, sacrifice himself. He always lived for others. And because of that, he never died in our hearts. And I have learned that his funeral is very cozy, very warm. A lot of uh, uh, brothers, sisters in Edmonton who know him for 30 years came and attend uh, and support for his funeral. And that is the way to Hanhum. 
You don't have to travel anywhere, but living in this life is already a travel. Is that true? We travel every day to one friend to each other. But how do we make the, the fragrance of the practice so people can remember us for all the time? He doesn't travel to India or anywhere, but he has traveled for 50 years in his life to all his friends, all of his relatives. Are we traveling now? We do. We are traveling in this life. And the question for, is, for us is, how do we make this travel become meaningful? Living in this life is a traveling. We come to this life like a, like a traveler. And one day, we'll stop traveling. We go back to our home. And every time when people talk about us, are we leaving something good in their heart? Are we leaving something beautifully? So every time when they talk about us, when they mention our name, there are a lot of, there are tears, there are laughs. And what is this? This is the successful living of a person. Why people um, do uh, create some of the statue of a hero? In their heart is a hero. Because people want to remind people have to learn from this person. So we have the right to say, I don't care. I just want to live my life whatever I can. That's nothing wrong. But it's a waste. We just spend the whole time to travel in this life, but nothing we gain for ourselves and nothing we leave back for life. You know, when I, um, I travel like that, I used to give uh, um, tips from myself, you know, personal tips for each of the tour guide. Of course, on the contract, we pay for them how much tips per each day, but I always give them more extra by myself. One day before I leave um, Bhutan, and I call all the tour guides come to my room, I thank them wholeheartedly, and I said, you know, I never think you guys are my services, but you guys are my brothers who live in Bhutan. Help me to understand the country, visit the country. And they start to cry. And I have an envelope, and I said, this is my small gift to all of you. I forgot the two truck drivers who drive our uh, luggages. So I made uh, two different envelopes. So I hope that tomorrow I can meet the driver and to give them um, directly. And I don't see the driver. I give to one of the, um, the two guys, and he said, Master, you gave us more than enough from yesterday. I, we already shared to the two drivers. You should keep this for yourself. Do they, they do not take more. And if they're greedy, they can take more. But they say, no, it's enough. You give us more than enough. You keep this for yourself. I can learn something from that person. So, you know, if we really want to learn, every single thing happened in this daily life can be a lecture for us to learn. If we really do not open our heart to learn, even you sit in the class, you're still sleeping because you never take any message from the teacher. And if you really want to learn, you can learn every day in, on the street. 
on the way. Before we um, we ended the retreat, I used to bring the group together and we sit together and for the Dharma discussion. So they can share their feelings, their thoughts, anything they want to share. And there is a, a young a couple who, who never attended the, the, the group like this and the first time in their life. And they say, I have learned you know, something while people talking together and I can see their heart are very open. In my heart, I always think, oh, I pay for the trip. So people have to service me. So I have to, I can expect, you know, people to do anything I want. But one day when I heard Thai talk to the two guys, you are my brothers who live in Bhutan. From now on, I have, my, my arm is more longer. I can reach to this country anytime. You know, I never think of that. And Thai have given me a lecture. And we assign two people live in a room. And I always encourage, take care of each other. And there was a lady there and another younger lady, never know each other. But you know, when they come to the group like this, they stay in one room together. And that older lady, she got sick after three days in India, very, very sick. And this younger lady take care of her like her own mother. After that, they become good friends. And the whole 70 people can learn something from this young girl. She doesn't go to temple often. She does not know much about Buddhism. But what is called Bodhisattva's work? What is called the Greek work? Right there. You don't have to become a, a holy person to help others. But right in front of you, there are people who are very sick. They need your help. And you just take off your time and help them. So after we leave home, a lot of good memories about it. This is what we call Han Hu, a good traveling. So I just want to share with you another meaning how Buddhists practice in this kind of uh, spiritual trip, spiritual tour. You pay for the trip, but not just for the tour. To enjoy, to leisure, but to practice for yourself, to learn from others, and to leave you know, something back for the country you visit. And if you look back deeply, and each of us is a traveler, this life is the place where we're traveling. People, places where we need to travel to. I know each of us have at least one or two people that every day we traveling to each other. But make sure we practice in such a way that we leave good things back in, in their heart. So one day after we need to finish the trip, we need to go back home. Every time when they talk about us, there are a lot of good things about us for them to learn. Thank you for your listening. Please uh, massage your legs before we stand up.